sorry about that. I had to hit record. <laughs> and I am very excited to introduce, is it Gina Capito? Yep. Gina. Okay, sorry. Uh, Gina Capito has been working in the prenatal to five field for nearly 25 years with experience including the management of childcare programming, early Head Start, Head Start, developmentally oriented pediatrics, national home visiting models, and child welfare pro programming. Um, Capito has focused on the development of state and local initiatives to increase quality of programs, access by families, and capacity of professionals and communities through systems change across social service agencies, education systems, home visiting services, public health programming, and healthcare systems. Capito's work has involved managing projects, including the development of birth to three early learning guidelines, recommending and implementing quality support structures for home visiting, crafting national scare, scale <laughs> learning communities across Head Start, and child care with their respective federal offices, managing comprehensive fiscal analysis and cost modeling projects, and building a technical assistance structure for collaborating or collaboration building. Capito brings strong working knowledge of both state and local systems, including work on policies and recommendations to ensure that systems at each level inform one another and are built in response to the characteristics of each other. Capito's consulting includes work building on her expertise in budget creation and management and ability to build the complementary fiscal governance and management systems to support collaboration and program implementation. So without further ado, <laughs> I will turn it over. Hi everyone, I'm Gina Capito. I work for an organization called Prenatal to Five Fiscal Strategies. So that that's how that landed in the title of the session. But what we're mainly gonna focus on this afternoon is understanding the cost of childcare a little bit more. Um, somewhat ironically, I have deep roots in home visiting and do a lot of work on home visiting cost and supporting states and local communities to do a better job in understanding the contract amounts that they build for home visiting programs because much of the same things that we're going to talk about now around why the child care market and the costs of child care are there's a disconnect is very similar in home visiting as well oftentimes kind of it comes down to that we only have a certain amount of money and so that's the money that we give a program to run the service and it's generally not what it actually costs that program to deliver the service that is sort of the the story of most things for families of young children and really in many ways sort of human and social services writ large is that we've got just this little pot and we need a much bigger pot and we're trying to do it on that shoestring that, that we've gotten. So we're going to spend a little more time talking about that nature of childcare, uh, hopefully in a way that will support you to help families to understand some of the dynamic of the childcare market. And if you are working with families as a home visitor or working with community resources as a home visiting program, um, to, to understand some of how things like the child care subsidy, how kind of important those can be as a source to help families in paying for child care, why it maybe doesn't cover the whole cost, we're going to talk about that, and that that's not a feature of the family, that's not a feature of necessarily the state either, it has a lot to do with the idea of how those dollars have been established, how the elements of the payment rates have been established, we're going to unpack that a little bit. I'm happy to take questions and I'll keep my eye on the chat even after I'm screen sharing. So there might be some points where I stop intentionally to make sure I'm not missing anything that comes in in the chat. Uh, we have about an hour here together, so I'll try not to talk too fast, but there's a fair amount of stuff to get through. So I wanna make sure that we cover it all. And then I'm happy to make the slides available in the conference platform if that's an option if Lori advises me on that one to make sure I, as I say that out loud, that I'm not making up something that's not an option. You are able to share. All right, so after the session, I'll PDF the deck and then you can go out and grab it. So let's jump in. So as Lori mentioned in reviewing my bio, uh, I've done this work 
across the country, states, local communities coming off of running programs myself. So I, I ran all manner of home visiting programs across multiple different models, both in nonprofit settings as well as public health settings. And then I've also ran childcare programming and Head Start and early Head Start programming. And one of the things that I always found across all of this work was that there was a, a significant disconnect between the dollars that were available to do the work. And so we were always trying to pursue foundation dollars, other strategies, cut corners or cut costs in order to try and make the budget balance. Yet it always seemed like the control of the money was not at the program. It wasn't our decision that we got what we got. It wasn't necessarily the state entity that gave us the dollars, right? There's always sort of someone above us. And so, and having done that sort of management for years and years, then I started working as a consultant and supporting other states and communities and programs in trying to be strong, well-functioning organizations that meet the needs of young families. And the issue of fiscal still kept coming up. Not enough money. We need more money. But there was also an element of, well, if we just put more money in the system and some of the elements of how the system functions that aren't very strong and are broken will just be perpetuated. So with some of those things in mind, my colleague Simon Workman and I launched this uh, national organization, Prenatal to Five Fiscal Strategies, where we've taken a lot of the very project specific work that we're doing, which we do continue to do, and we're trying to have that become part of a field movement, sort of changing the way we think about the financing of prenatal to five and sort of not just thinking, well, this is the way it's done. This is how contracts get set. This is how we understand cost and really but kind of break some of those uh, silos or the approaches that we've used that historically kind of land us in the same place, that things, we don't have enough money for what we're trying to do. And even the resources that we have for the slots they're covering are not covering the actual cost of those slots. We've got to do something about it at the foundation, right? We can't keep trying to just band-aid over the problem. And so one of the areas that we do a lot of work in is childcare. And um, as part of this presentation, what I was asked to do was talk a little bit about sort of the nature of the cost of childcare and how rates are set to pay for childcare. Because as we know, in many communities, there is a supply issue for childcare. There may be slots that are cost more than a family can pay. And that may leave families feeling really like, I thought that that was supposed to be a, a resource for me. How am I supposed to go to work if I can't afford or find childcare, right? There's a lot of sort of elements to the sort of broken nature of how the childcare system functions. And not all of them, but many of them come back to how the money comes into the system. And so I wanted to unpack that a little bit with you before we then talk about some of the approaches that some states have been using to try and right the ship, trying to fix the problem and how that may impact families. So I want to start with this most basic idea that the childcare market fundamentally is broken in how it's structured. So the childcare market really has two pieces. It has the private pay piece, and then it has subsidy, which subsidy is the publicly funded childcare slots. There's federal dollars that are available, and then states also have to put in some dollars with those federal dollars. But every state, territory, tribe in the country receives fed federal child care dollars. So everybody has a subsidy side to their system. Child care is also very much made up of individuals, private pay, families purchasing care for their children uh, because there are some families don't qualify for subsidy. And then there are also instances where subsidy is not available. So with that, private pay is a big piece of the child care system. The reality is that families, especially families of very young children, are very price sensitive consumers. And if the family qualifies for subsidy, they are going to be below a certain income level, because that is one of the requirements of the subsidy funding. So right there, they're much less likely to have income that they can pay a high price for that childcare that they may need in order to be able to go to work because they are families of young children and they are typically low income families of young children that are accessing subsidy. Sort of even outside of being a lower income family, high quality early care and education services, full day, full year childcare in early care and education settings costs more than what 
probably 80% of the families in our communities, if not more, can pay and or could take out of their take-home pay and put towards that purpose, right? They wouldn't be able to pay their rent or their mortgage and buy food and buy clothes and things and pay for their car and their gas to get to work. Um, it's just the reality once we actually start to understand the actual cost of childcare. Unfortunately, this has the effect of lowering the demand for quality because programs can find that it costs them less to deliver the service if they deliver a lower quality service. So if you were a childcare classroom that had three staff, yet you're only required by regulations to have two staff, it's a heck of a lot cheaper to serve the same number of children with two staff than it is to pay for that third staff person. So those, those are the types of decisions that programs, the position that programs are put into, um, and they just kind of stay at that minimum level of quality because of the fact that they know families can't pay for that third staff person. They're not really able to pay even for just the two staff people. The other reality is, is that there is competition, which in a market, typically we want competition. When we think about childcare, and that's where the broken nature of it is, is an important piece of this dynamic, is that the competition is resulting in the wrong things. If you're a family child care provider and you set out to provide family child care to the community that you live in, the place that you rent or own a home, you want to provide care to the children in that community. If you know that it's going to cost you $1,000 a month to provide the child care, yet the family child care provider down the street is only charging $700 a month, you're in competition right there. And families are, again, put in that position of having to make a choice based on the price, not necessarily they may prefer the provider who's saying I need $1,000 a month, but they can't afford it. They have to go with the 700. That other provider who's saying I needed 1,000 to cover my cost is now saying I'm gonna offer my care at 700 a month and I'm gonna take a loss because otherwise I'll have no families choosing my care, right? And I, my, the idea was I wanted to be a family child care provider and I, want, I need to have children that are in my care in order to actually run my business and have any revenue coming in. So it's sort of the wrong reason that providers are making decisions on what the price is because they're being influenced by these other market factors. So that also discourages those programs from investing more in their own program, whether it's a family child care, which is done at an individual's home, or whether it's a center. They're in this position of saying, I know I'm not going to get any more revenue in to put more money into my program to increase the quality of it or the capacity of my program. That, that does not benefit me because I'm not going to be able to make any more money running this business. So there's a few things in there that are disincentivizing is the, the way we refer to it quality and the delivery of care. The other the reason, the way these two things play together and sort of what makes it even more fundamentally broken is that that private pay, which is not representative of what it actually costs to deliver childcare, private pay is representative of what the market can bear of a family paying for. It's not the cost again, it's the tuition or what a family is paying is actually what is used in 49 of the 50 states in the United States to set the publicly funded subsidy rate. So the price that a provider is able to charge a family and that a family is able to pay is actually the source of information that is informing the publicly funded subsidy rate. And then in turn, it's very cyclical, you end up with providers and communities where families are lower income and therefore have less available income to pay for childcare, those same providers, when they go to receive payment from the subsidy system, which is the public funding source, they are going to be get paid a lower rate because of the fact that families in their community could not pay any more of their salary for childcare. Again, not based in cost, not based in the idea of it cost me $1,000 to deliver childcare, that's information that it should inform the public subsidy rate. Instead, we see that, that cycle. It does really uh, reinforce some of the inequities 
because historically uh, disenfranchised communities, oftentimes communities of color, are lower income communities, and those are the places that the subsidy rates are even lower because of the nature of if the subsidy rate is based on what a family can pay for childcare, not what it costs the provider to deliver childcare, then the provider has a much smaller amount that is available to them from the subsidy system than they would get if they were in a community where the families could pay more for childcare. And sort of, the, again, the wrong driver of what determines how much a provider can make by taking subsidy it can be a disincentive to providers to take subsidy because if they know the subsidy rates are pretty low, they figure, well, I'm not even going to attempt to go and take subsidy. It's not even worth my effort, which then can be unfortunate for families because families, that may be the only way that they could pay for care is to access subsidy. And if providers don't take it, it means less options for families to pick from. So the reason I pointed out that 50, 48 of 50, 49 of 50 states. So there is, states have recently been allowed to move away from using private pay or the market rate and move towards using cost of care to set their rates. It's a fairly recent thing. There was about 25 years of childcare where it was the only way to do it was based on your market rate. Uh, but recently, states have been allowed to move towards using cost of care to inform rate setting instead of using market rate. Uh, it's a slow shift. There's a lot of states that are interested in it, and there's probably another at least four or five states that we've worked with to help them move towards moving away from market rate and moving to cost, but it takes time. That doesn't happen overnight. So District of Columbia and New Mexico are the two places. So one a state and then one the District of Columbia have moved officially from using market rate or private pay and instead using cost of service to inform the subsidy rate setting. And that's a big switch in their system. And it's hopefully what their goal is to be more fair to providers, which should then incentivize more providers to take subsidy, which hopefully will make more childcare available to families that qualify for subsidy, more options for families. So this is one of those places where it can open up access for families in our communities when we move in this direction. And so just sort of a, a reiteration or like highlighting of this concept of the market rate compared to cost. So the market rate or the private pay are surveys that are done at providers. Providers tell the state how much they charge, the price that they charge families. Again, it's not necessarily what it actually costs them. And nine times out of 10, providers will tell you, no, it's not what it costs me. It's what families can afford to pay in my community. Uh, and that they, we also know that by the reality of that, that if you're sort of balancing your program budget on an amount that's less than what it actually costs you, you're likely doing it with low wages because about 70 to 80% of the budget for childcare, for home visiting, for most social services is compensation to the people that work in the program. So the only way to keep your doors open if you're running a program and you don't have enough revenue compared to what it actually costs you to do it, the only place that you can save money for lack of a good term is in the personnel, the people that work there because there's, there's so few other places right in the budget that you would be sort of cutting. Um, the other thing that ends up happening is it's not so much cutting the budget, and I know as home visitors and having been a home visitor myself, we, you can relate to this. And as a, a manager of home visitor program, we do the work on our personal time because there's not enough staff. We don't have enough money to hire the staff that we need to do some of the support features, but we have to get ready for Monday morning to show up in our classroom with our children or to go to the first home that we're visiting or to do reflective supervision with our staff. So we do the work to get ready for that on the weekend because there was work that we had to do during the week that there wasn't any other staff to do it. So we had to, to fill our time. So we know people work more like 60, 70, 80 hours a week instead of the 40 they're being paid for. And that's that's one of the main ways that childcare and home visiting programs in particular keep afloat is the staff commitment to sort of getting the job done no matter the hours of the day. We, we know that makes tremendous burden on the individuals in the positions at all levels of our organizations, managers, and all levels of staff. And it results in pretty high turnover, right? We do the job for a couple of years and it's too much. The personal, what we're giving up in our personal lives, we reach a point where that this is all I can do. I have to move on to a different type of position, even if I love the work, even if I would want to take care of infants in an infant classroom for the rest of my life, it's not 
it's not tenable. I can't continue it. So these things really are this idea of the market and the system existing on the backs of the employees who are generally pretty low income earning employees, maybe just above minimum wage if they're lucky earning employees. So we're not talking about people that are making a really high salary and being asked to work on the weekends. That, that's not what we're talking about here. That's what informs the market rate, frankly, because that's the reality of a program's experience. And then they say, okay, well, this is the price I'm charging families when I run my business this way, because this is really the only way I can do it to keep my, my business functioning. There is a world where the market rate, and it's because the market rate's not unique to childcare, there are places where it does work, the market rate would work if consumers could afford the true cost of care. So they could pay for that third teacher in a classroom. So all the staff only work 40 hours a week instead of having to do work in the evenings and on the weekends, sort of like Starbucks, right? When we go to Starbucks and buy a four or $5 cup of coffee, when we know we can make the coffee at home for you know, pennies on that, um, we we are made a choice there. We are we are supporting the market that Starbucks believes that coffee costs them that much. We are part of paying for it because we pay that full cost to the true cost that Starbucks. You know, we don't come in and say, I could have made this for 30 cents at my house. Why are you charging me this much? It's not, it's not the way it works. But in that sense, the market bears itself because we go in and we buy. We buy it at the, the price that it's assigned to us. That's not the way childcare works because over the course of many, many years, we found providers then don't have families that they're serving. So they've had to adjust their price to account for the families that they're trying to serve in their communities. And that obviously from the element of how subsidy works, this information on market in childcare is feeding directly into the setting of public subsidy rates. So you kind of start to see the broken nature of how it works. While we have the opportunity to move to cost, we do need to acknowledge that at this point in time, there is actually two big considerations on cost that, and we have to think about it almost as a continuum, that price, which we've been talking about now for a couple slides, is this element of what the market can bear, what families are actually paying, right? We've established what price is. Cost are the actual current expenses of a program, whether it's a home visiting program or a childcare program, that those current expenses are not reflective yet of the true cost of the service. And the reason for that is because if the revenue that's been available to you for 20 plus years is not reflective of how much it costs you to do the work, you have made choices along the way that have gotten you as close to possible as balancing the budget, right? So that the money in and the money out equal each other. That's not necessarily reflective of what you want to do. Back to that two, three teacher example. If you want to have three teachers in the classroom because you know that that is the quality and that's what the children in the classroom need, yet you've had to stay at two, then the two teachers is the cost, your current actual cost. The true cost is would be with that third teacher, how much does it actually cost to do this work? That, so that's one big thing that we're all really careful about at this point in time as we start moving towards understanding cost and having cost drive decisions about funding is that it's not enough to just stop with current costs. We know we have situations where we have staff that have never been offered any health insurance, any paid time off, any sick days, none of that because the budget cannot afford it. And so you hire the staff person at minimum wage and they don't get any benefits outside of that they get paid. That is not a true cost of operating the program when we think about one of the things that we need to do is attract people to work in our programs and people need health insurance. People want paid sick days. They want paid time off. And so when we build those expenses in, so it's a compensation, not just salary, then we're getting more to the true cost. What does it actually cost to have an employee? I happen to live in the Western suburbs of Chicago. So not too far away from, from you all and have ran home visiting program in, in Illinois for years and years. And one of the things when I started in home visiting almost 25 years ago now, we had lots of very small programs and lots of multiple partial FTEs. And part of what was happening is the staff, especially staff at programs like school districts or um, public health entities were not hired at 
an FTE large enough where they qualified for the health benefits of the program or of the organization, because the program budget could not support paying for the health benefits. So we had a lot of people that were at 0.5 of an FTE, because if they got to 0.75, then they qualified for health insurance, right? And that was the only way that the home visiting manager and have myself having been one at one point could take the money that came in to run my program and balance the budget to stay afloat within the organization. The organization wasn't gonna support me to be able to offer people health benefits. That, that was sort of the dynamic that had been established. Uh, that is not one, it's not a fair dynamic because we rely on the idea that the women or men we're hiring have somebody else that supports their health insurance or some other way that they get health insurance. Um, a lot of the programs in the one community I worked in, it was women, kind of sort of midlife women that happened to be married. And so their spouse carried the health insurance. So they were able to have health insurance, but it really meant that it was uh, very limiting on the types of individuals that could take the jobs, right? If you were a young woman and you needed to pay for your own health insurance, home visiting wasn't the, the job for you. And so it was limiting for the not the right reasons. This is a similar issue in childcare that we are putting people in positions of having to choose between a job that they may love and that the Amazon call center offers health insurance, right? I mean, we hear this all the time and it's certainly been made far, far worse by the, the pandemic and people realizing sort of the, the pressure and demand on their individually and on their family and that they have to make certain choices. So that's one of the most critical features of moving to a true cost is we don't want to just stop at what a program is doing currently in order to balance the books, but really think about what is the true cost of operating that you need to be sustainable, healthy, and have staff in your program that may choose to stay because they can stay. They get to get the kind of compensation that they need to be able to stay in the program. And we know we want that for families, right? We want that for families in all of our programs. We don't want turnover in the services to families that they see from the teacher they have or the home visitor they have. We want to have that longevity in the relationship. So as we move to cost of care, we started using a concept called cost modeling. And so this is where, as we think about the idea of that broken nature of using the market rate to inform, we immediately then say, okay, well, how do we go about understanding what the cost of care is, especially if what you just said is that the current cost of programs aren't the best judge of what the true cost of care is. We've moved to doing something called using cost modeling, where we think about some of the core features of things like we have values around health insurance, we have values around paid time off for people, we have states that have begun working on using living wage data, what does it actually cost someone to live in this community with a child of their own to support, how much do they need to make to be able to live in this community and work using that sort of information and modeling the cost of the service so that we're actually working from that sort of not vision, but more of a benchmark of reality of the true cost to run these programs and sustain them well versus using, well, for the last 20 years, I've only paid minimum wage and I've been able to, yeah, staff turnover every 18 months, but I find somebody else. But we think about the amount of waste of time that's taken when we lose people, especially people that don't want to leave the job. We can eliminate some of that by some of these values that we established in using a cost model. And so what I wanted to talk a little bit about was just the idea of what a cost model is to start with the most basic. And it really is a tool. And the way that the organization that I co-lead, we build them in Excel. So just simple Microsoft Excel has a tremendous amount of formulas in it because it allows people to ask different questions. And when we talk about a childcare cost model, the types of things that they're trying to understand about the direct service are things like if I serve infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, how much does each of those ages cost me to serve? If I only served preschoolers, how much does it cost me to serve them? If I only serve infants and toddlers, how much does it cost me to serve them? The cost models allow those sorts of questions to be asked and to understand sort of the like output of, okay, what impact does it have? One of the things that we found over the years and programs would be the first to tell you that we knew it all along, infants cost a lot more money to serve than preschoolers do in childcare. You only get 
maybe eight to 10 infants in a classroom to two teachers, you could have 24 preschoolers in a classroom to two teachers. So if you just took the salary of those two teachers, divided it by 10 children, divided it by 24, clearly the cost per child is going to be lower for the preschool age child, right? It's just the nature of the needs of the child. What we've also known for years and years is that if you serve infants, you generally have to serve preschoolers too, because the only way you're going to balance your budget is if those bigger kids who cost less are in the, the building too, because infants and toddlers cost so much to serve and the revenue never comes anywhere near covering what it costs to serve infants and toddlers. But there are some places where the amount that you get paid for a preschooler comes pretty darn close to the cost of it. So you're able, you actually balance the ages of children against each other. There's things like preschool, state preschool programming or preschool for all initiatives that states have had, those have been a massive disruption in the ecosystem that is community-based childcare programs. Because if you have ran a childcare for years and it's been a birth to five program and suddenly funding is available to serve those preschool age children and takes them out of the community-based program, often you serve them in a school setting, then suddenly the whole thing that helped you to balance your budget as a community-based program is gone. You're not, you don't have, you have a handful of preschoolers where you might've had four preschool classrooms before, now you have one. And no, you no longer get that balance where infants and toddlers cost a lot of money, but preschoolers don't cost as much. So it balances out. It's been sort of like literally stripped away. What we've then found, and you may have experienced this in talking to your families about the reality of finding infant toddler care is that more and more programs have had to, oftentimes they'll first start by shutting their youngest infant room, so under 12 months, because those are the most expensive, they'll close that classroom because they can keep serving those older toddlers, the 12 to 24 or 12 to 18 month olds. And then a few years later, they find that the 12 to 18 months that that's getting too expensive to keep serving. Next thing you know, you have a program that you're lucky if they're taking two-year-olds. They're really moving away from those most expensive ages because of the fact that the other resources and funding have changed, the dyna dynamic has changed, or just that the costs have gone up so much for serving infants and toddlers, they can't maintain it anymore. So this is things that really have an impact on the families in our community, right? If they know they need to return to work and they're seeking a care option, they could be really, really stressed out by the fact that there's not anything out there or there's nothing that's convenient. There's nothing that's maybe where they're driving, which is one of the major features of childcare is convenience of where am I going to work and where is childcare in relationship to it, right? So when we think about those features, we, we start to think about how stressed the families that we're serving with home visiting programs can be when they're looking at the idea that and then combined with the fact they might not want to return to work. They might, you know, they might have a lot of emotion around leaving the baby. Uh, so there's a lot of things that, that as home visitors, right, you're, you're carrying as you try to help them kind of wade through this new universe and understanding where, why supply may be an issue in a community. Uh, while it may not be that much comfort to a family, for you to understand it a little bit more may be helpful to think about how do I help them to be more proactive in thinking about things like family childcare settings. Family childcare is a really strong, high quality option and maybe more regionally available to a family, like in their actual neighborhood, and maybe they wouldn't have to drive as far to access it. So you kind of have to start to think a little bit until some of these bigger problems are solved, what are ways that we can help families get the types of supports that they need in order to be able to return to work? What are some other options for them? One of the other things that modeling, cost modeling does, whether it's for home visiting or childcare or home visiting, either one, um, is it dem can demonstrate the impact of multiple funding sources. So I mentioned before that in the course of working in the field, there was always, we have to find more money, we have to find more money. The reality is that yes, we may need more money to, to be able to keep doing our programs, but every source of money that we bring in comes with more administration required of it. Sometimes it comes with different regulations or expectations. This happens a lot in the world of childcare where one funding stream will hold the program to a certain set of regulations, another funding stream 
like the federal Head Start or Early Head Start funding stream has an entirely different set of regulations. Many of them are much more stringent. So I shouldn't say different, they're more stringent than say state licensing. And so programs have to adjust to meet obviously they're always meeting licensing and then they meet the more stringent regulations as well. Managing more than one funding stream coming into a program can be a pretty big accounting and fiscal burden on a program, which can mean that then if they don't have any extra money to hire an, an accounting clerk or an accounting staff person, then the program manager or director is left doing all of that work. One of the ways that I got involved in this myself is because I've never ran any program where I wasn't fully responsible for my own budget, everything about tracking it, everything about reporting it, no matter how many funding streams we had. So I spent a lot of time as a manager and director with the budget and the fiscal side of things and just saw repeatedly like what a burden it was and that while I sort of enjoyed it, it um, obviously I'm doing a presentation on cost modeling to you today. So obviously I enjoyed it to a certain extent. It also really struck me how that's not the reason most of us got into this field was to spend all day with what in the old days were green bars printed out of huge printers. So that was our budget. That's not the reason we got into it. We got into it because of babies. And if we're lucky as a manager, maybe we enjoy working with adults because we work with a lot of adults. We did, don't care so much about the math and the numbers. And so, but there's a lot of burden put on managers and directors and to keep the program healthy from a fiscal perspective that oftentimes is not the skill set of the individuals in the job. So that that idea of the impact of multiple funding sources is not always a positive thing. It's about that burden on staff that comes with trying to, to keep all the plates spinning of multiple funding streams. So we pull all that into sort of the methodology of how that tool, that Excel workbook works in order to support states and communities and having questions, answers to the questions around what is the cost of childcare? Because again, we're, we're focusing on the idea of childcare cost modeling today, primarily. So there's a couple different reasons that cost models then will be used. And it kind of depends on what folks are trying to, to do with it. The, what I've talked a little bit about with establishing the broken childcare market is that second bullet of the concept of the subsidy rate setting. One of the clearest sort of lines is that if you have a cost model that helps you understand the cost of childcare is you can use that answer, those answers to the cost of childcare to help you set rates to pay providers for taking children that are covered by subsidy. Like that's the most sort of most linear way. We also know that many times there are advocates in states that will use a cost model to work with the legislature around the idea of what additional investments are needed in the childcare system in the state. Same thing with home visiting. How do we get more, how do we get a line item in our general fund budget for home visiting? We can use answers to cost question as an advocacy tool to help us with that. So there's the sort of depth of the cost model may vary a little bit based on, on the reason that you're using it, but there's a lot of different ways that states and communities can make use of the cost modeling tool and to answer questions. Um, the costing out of initiatives is a great one because a lot of times we do things like say, I want to do this in the community with children and families. And we may have a million dollars to do that and we wanna do it for a thousand families, but the actual cost of doing it for a thousand families may be 5 million. Something has to give. We either need to serve less children than the thousand, right? Or we need to get more money. So, but all, we frequently don't know that answer when we go about a new initiative. We have a pot of money and a goal that's been set sometimes by a legislature or a private funder saying, I want this many children to be served and this is the money that's there. And they don't sort of acknowledge the disconnect between, well, actual cost is here to serve that number of children. So something has to go up or the number of children has to go down, right? Uh, we frequently don't do that sort of exercise before we launch new things in part because folks will say, well, there wasn't the information to answer the question to really understand it. Um, so we're trying to say that, well, with cost modeling, that, that shouldn't be our reason anymore. The a couple other things I wanted to share about the idea of a cost model um, before we talk about, show some impact of state that has actually used one for childcare rate setting is just to highlight the fact that this is very much driven by the individuals in the state and in the community that work on 
childcare or that are whatever program we're building a cost model for. So when we say constituents here, what we're talking about is the providers and the programs, because this is going to feel like change. It is change. While it might be change in the positive direction, it's also disrupts sort of the whole situation that they've built and the way they maintain their business that they run now. So change can be scary. And so we want through presentations like this, through conversations about the idea of, yes, what you know right now is this market rate, but the, here's how the market rate is actually a disservice to you. And here's how it, it's, it's actually not helping you with your business. So let's talk about what it actually costs to do the work that you're doing. And let, let's move towards a more fair approach to setting rates. So engaging constituents is a really important piece of it. It's also the element that supports us with having data. While the actual cost data should not be the only driver of understanding the cost of care, it is an important benchmark to understand that under the current revenues and the current cost, there is a disconnect. Because sometimes we have leadership, legislators, that feel like, well, if we actually understood their current costs, they may that may be fine, the revenue that we currently give them. So we like to establish that baseline to say, no, actually, even at the low income, people don't have health insurance, all those other factors that I already delineated, the costs are here and the revenue that's available to them is here. So even without addressing quality and true cost of care, we already have a gap. Revenue is still far below. So we try to help some of that current data to help establish sort of that this is how broken things are. And then we're going to ask you for true cost and it's going to cost even more because we want people to make a living wage. We want their, we want this to be a viable field that people work in and, and feel rewarded for working in and valued for working in. Then we develop the model and that too involves a lot of work with the constituents and talking about how the model's functioning. Is it, is, does this function the way that is reflective of how you run childcare programs, right? We really vet those sorts of concepts. And then we get into running the different scenarios. So asking questions of the model, like what does it cost to serve children from birth to five years of age in a center-based childcare program? What does it cost to serve them in a home-based or a family childcare program, right? This, that's what we mean by scenarios in this instance. And again, there's not a single answer to that question. And that's one of the last things in the world of talking about a model that I, before we look into results that I want to talk about is just to reiterate sort of how the model as a tool functions. So that idea of what is a cost model itself, that it is a tool that does demonstrate the gap from multiple funding sources. So we already sort of talked about that. If there is a gap, the model will identify it, right? When we put in revenue and cost. And that it's really important to acknowledge that there is not going to be one answer to the cost of childcare. Because if you're a family childcare, your cost is going to be different than if you're a center-based program. Or if you're a center-based program who serves preschoolers and school-age children, and you're a center that serves birth to five. Those are two different types of programs. So the answer to the cost question is gonna be different. But all of those different scenarios are using the cost of doing, doing the service to understand cost versus using something like the market rate. So while there's not one single answer because you have these different program characteristics you put in, the methodology of using a cost model is shared across settings. Same thing when I do home visiting cost model building, you have different home visiting models and different models have different caseloads, have different ratios of home visitor to um, supervisor, right? There's variations. So the cost of different home visiting models should be different. It doesn't mean one home visiting program or model is better than another. It means that there are different characteristics to how they operate. It's very similar in childcare. And a cost model helps to make that transparent, which people can really appreciate. And it also is because it's using a consistent approach it's there's consistency and understanding each other then, which can be really helpful too. Instead of that feeling of, well, a legislator is going to go and pick the cheapest home visiting model. Well, no, let's talk about why one model may be less than another, but you're getting different things when you purchase those models. And, and what you need to do is make a decision on which is the best model for your state or community. Here's Fred. Go. So let's talk a little bit about this concept of cost of care or cost of quality actually in practice. So the state that I mentioned that has used cost of quality 
officially with their federal funding is New Mexico, as well as the District of Columbia has done it. Uh, we're going to look at New Mexico examples right now. There are a third state that has gotten approval and will be using it officially within the next four weeks or so. They're going to have the, their new child care rates will hit the street that will be and be based on cost equality. And there's about three or four other places that are actively pursuing it. So we're starting to see a shift as states really move to saying, I want to understand cost and I want that cost of child care to inform how I go about making child care available to families. And that's, I think, as we look at some of the impacts from New Mexico, you start thinking about it from the vantage point of the families that we serve, we start to see how much more accessible childcare is because subsidy rates are paying for more of it, which makes sort of makes subsidy more appealing to a childcare program in a community if they can get, they actually can get closer to what their cost is by taking the subsidy payment. So what we're starting with are a couple excerpts of the report that after we built the childcare cost model for New Mexico, we ran scenarios in the model to understand the concept of the cost and then available revenues. So the both figures, which are both family childcare, one is infants and one is toddlers, you will notice that the top line of the bar chart is a zero and every single colored bar goes below it. That's because there is not an instance where the, the revenue to cover the cost of the service for the child is more than what the cost of the service is. There's a variance on how much a provider loses. And the different colors here are, if you're familiar with the childcare world, they, uh, many states have a quality rating system in their state and they have levels. In New Mexico, theirs are stars. So the two or blue column or blue bar is the lowest quality program. That program for every infant they serve loses $290 between the cost of what it is to serve that infant and how much money they get paid by the state of New Mexico for serving that infant. They lose $290 per infant. If they are a little higher quality, the yellow star or two plus or three star, they lose $328 they lose a little bit less money if they're a four star and a five star. Not much, but they lose a little bit less money. If you sort of follow me for a second, you see right up front on both charts, as a provider, you lose the least amount of money if you stay at the lowest quality point. That in essence, as you just sort of boil down, if you take nothing else away from this chart, that we are incentivizing providers to stay at the lowest level quality because the higher levels of quality have more regulations, it has more cost to those regulations, yet the increased payment doesn't keep up with the increased cost. So there's sort of more than one dimension to the idea of cost of care. There's not just the base level, but then there's if you ask more out of people and you say you'll pay them more, the more you pay them doesn't keep up with what it actually costs them to deliver more. That's what the, those color bars are telling us here. So New Mexico had to make, this was, these are just two, the, the infants in family child care settings and toddlers in family child care. There are similar charts for center-based settings, for preschoolers, for school age, the whole, the whole gamut. There's charts just like this in, in the report. Um, they all tell the same story. There's not an instance where there's a chart. The school age kids are, are pretty much even, that the cost of serving a school age child, which is a child that comes before and after school, is very close to the revenue that's available to a provider. It's almost almost on the nose, but there's not really any other instance. So then the, the state working with the community of child care providers had an opportunity to really think about, this is cost information coming out of the cost model. How do we take this and inform our rates? Because there's there's that piece of understanding cost, and then there's what you do with what you learn from the rates. And so there were a couple very critical policy decisions that that New Mexico made sort of right out the gate. And the first section of the slide really speaks to this. They wanted to address their biggest inequities in the first year of they just did this in 21. So they've only been doing it for a year where they where they made this policy change. And the biggest inequities that they found were in family child care. Family child care had the biggest losses as a type of child care. And then infant and toddler care in centers 
as well as family child care, but particularly in centers, lost more money than preschoolers. So when they built their rates, they wanted to get as close as possible to making family child care providers whole for providing the service, as well as making providers who serve infants and toddlers in centers or family child care whole, because they really felt that this was an issue. They have a lot of family child care in the state of New Mexico, so a lot of families rely on that for, to go to work. And for those providers to be in such a poor position, how much money they're losing every year serving children, it's just perpetuating that pretty soon they're just going to close their doors because and then families aren't going to have any family child care in their community. Same thing with infant toddler care. They wanted to say, we don't want centers that tell us a story. Oh, I used to serve infants two years ago, but I stopped because I couldn't make enough money. Right. They wanted to stop that from happening because it's been happening for years. And so they wanted to put a stop to it. So they made decisions around rate setting for this first year that really focused on that really historic inequity that they had been experiencing. They will probably make different decisions every year about rate setting when they look at the landscape and they see if they've sort of kind of fixed things for family child care, then maybe they can address more of that gap in preschool, right? So they have to make decisions because there's only so much money that they have as a state to use, but and they want to use it wisely as they think about those rate setting decisions. One of the next things that they definitely want to do is uh, MWO is the minimum wage ordinance their minimum wage ordinance in the state in 2020 and 2021 was on the lower side. They definitely want to raise the minimum wage in the model. They want to see compensation go up. They want to have more, uh, the, like, so the floor would not be below 15, that no one in the program would make less than $15 an hour. They'd like in the two years later, no one makes less than $18 an hour. And then obviously individuals with more responsibility make more. So they have some longer term planning goals around compensation, trying to really address compensation. And so that'll be like their next thing that they're working on as a rate or policy decision. So that gives you sort of a sense of kind of what the state does from their vantage point. Um, what I also wanted to share as a summary is sort of the how it came together to impact providers in the state of New Mexico. So there's two things on here comparing prior rates to new rates. So the increase in rates is the first thing that we're going to look at over here on the left side of the, the slide. The increase in rates between the subsidy rates that were set on the market and in those that were set on the cost model. Rates increased by 54% for infants, 83% for toddlers, 70% for preschoolers and only a 1% increase for school age. But remember I said it was pretty close. The school age was pretty almost on the nose, the rate compared to the, the cost. The other ages were not like that at all. Toddlers, because of the sort of nature of the right state regulations were actually faring the worst. Providers trying to serve toddlers were faring the worst. They were held to pretty strict regulations of an infant, but they were paid a much, much lower rate than infants. So they really had to kind of look at this and they made certain judgment calls in order to address those disparities. The next slide, next um, table over to the right shows you, so 2020 was rates that were set under the market rate. On average, a center was underfunded by 21% under the market rate, family child care was underfunded by 38%, and group homes, which are large family child care homes, were underfunded by 27%. Under new rates, under cost of quality, both, both types of family child care are made 100% whole in the, the cost of their care compared to the revenue available to them, and centers at this point are only underfunded by 6%. So, not everybody's right and equal in how the decisions were made in part because of the where the biggest inequities were but there everybody's moved in the right direction and pretty significantly moved in the right direction right so what their goal is is that will look even better in 22 when they set rates again or in 23 when they set rates again so this is all sort of a long-term change process it doesn't happen overnight when states make this this sort of impact this is a pretty pretty big step that New Mexico made to get family child cares to being equal, expense and revenue, District of Columbia didn't get there the first time they made the rate changes. So states have to think about what revenue they have available to do this sort of work. What I wanted to do with the last couple minutes that we have together 
is just talk about this idea of impact in the sense of your your role and sort of the impact of this information in serving children and families through home visiting and in communities. And, and one of the things that, that I do have to, even with all the faults of how a subsidy system currently uses the market rate, when we hear families talk about either not knowing how to access subsidy or they tried to complete the subsidy paperwork and they were turned down or they don't know that it exists or they feel like, oh, that's not for me. That's for different types. Those, that's for families that are worse off than me. There's a lot of reasons that families tell us that they don't go to WIC or that they don't access a benefit that may be available to them in their community. That's one of the things that that most strikes me that I that I feel compelled to talk a little bit about is that that your role in home visiting and family support maybe just to be an ambassador to what is available, understanding the child care subsidy system, helping a family think a little bit about if they're choosing not to apply for it because they feel like, oh, there are people that need it more than I do. Like talk that through with them a little bit, not to say, and I know as home visitors, you would never force your perspective on a family. That's not what we do, but offering more education and understanding, and maybe even offering a little bit of that education on the childcare, because of the fact that it's a broken market, is not designed that you as a family can pay the full amount. It's not designed that way right now. And it's not a fault of the childcare program. It's not a fault of them as a family. So accessing the subsidy, if you're eligible for it, is not about you taking it from someone else. It is about the fact that this system needs the gap filled that even if the subsidy doesn't fully fill the gap, it is more than what a family on their own can pay for childcare. So sort of walking them through and being their um, support for the application process, especially if they've filled it out and they've gotten turned down in the past, or they've only gotten approved for say three days a week when they needed five days a week. Sometimes we, and having done this for years with families, we'd say, Go ahead, start with the three. We will reapply. We will submit more paperwork that demonstrates that you are working five days a week, but don't turn down the three days a week because you didn't get the five on the first pass. Now you're in the system. It actually is easier usually in most states to get a family moved from a part-time position subsidy to a full-time than starting from scratch. So like, let's get you in the system because then you kind of know how it works and then we'll work on moving you to qualifying for more, right? So those are the, when I think about the role of, of um, home visiting, I think that that's a really critical thing is this idea of being that advocate and doing that sort of education and just being a place that families can talk about these things that talk about the frustration and maybe shedding a little bit light on the fact that the childcare system is a broken system right now and many states and childcare leaders are working on it because it's not fair to families, right? The things that they're experiencing they're not wrong if they're feeling like, why is this so hard? Why can't I find childcare? They're not alone, which we all feel a lot better when we know we're not alone. And that some of the nature of the way the system is currently built is actually working in against us and sort of working in our disfavor. And so I think that helping families see some of those kind of structural things, well, again, they may say, well, what does that mean for me right now? I can't necessarily change it. It may make them feel better to know this isn't just about them as a family of a young child, that that's one more thing that's that's um, just trying to make it harder for me, that they're not in this alone. And that there are there's work that states are doing to try and, and make change on this. And so I think that advocacy and education. So hopefully having access to the deck, I am happy to put my email address in the chat. You're um, welcome to reach out at any time. Um, and talk about it more, that that sort of thing can really support some of the impact for families. And then there's always the opportunity for families to be advocates for like, we need better rates for childcare. Why don't you use cost of care for childcare, right? Those are some of the strongest voices that our legislators hear can be from families. So don't hesitate to help them rally, right, for that sort of messaging as well. So that is all I have for you this afternoon. And I think we are just before the hour. I didn't see any questions, uh, content questions in the chat at this point. But like I said, I'm happy to share the deck and also share my email address. Thank you all for hanging in there with me. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, we have ended for the day. Um,
but please make sure to come back for tomorrow. We have some really great things going uh, tomorrow afternoon. We'd love to see you all. Does anybody have any questions before we finish tonight? Okay, well, if we have no questions, um, have a wonderful evening and we look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. Lori, could I just put the, the deck in the chat and you could grab it or do you want me to put it out in the platform? Um, can you put it out in the platform for me? Okay, yes, hopefully we'll cross cross our fingers. That I can. <laughs> if, if you're having problems getting it, um, if you just want to email me, I will put my email in here. Okay, sorry. I'm using a different keyboard and I'm trying to make sure I type in correct. Yeah, I'm not. <clears throat> Let me grab your email because I'm out there right now seeing if I could. Okay. See where files are, but I don't see where upload is. Maybe I'm in the wrong spot. That's all right. I can make sure to get it in there. Okay, yeah, because now I'm in editing my profile, which is not, not, not the right place. Because <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and make the PDF right now. So I'm going to click on your email. Perfect. So don't not get it done today. All right, well, thank you so much.